Hey everyone, good evening and happy Thursday. Hope you all are enjoying your night tonight. Um, welcome back to our Baptist uh, For Her Blue Zone series. I'm excited um, to have you all back with me tonight for the conversation. And so we're gonna be continuing talking about those Blue Zone Power Nine, which are the nine health habits that the experts from the Blue Zones have found to enhance our longevity. Um, but before we get started and before I introduce my wonderful speaker with me tonight, I just wanna remind you all that this series is also leading up to the Sisiski Kleppinger um, Endowed Annual Lecture for Women's Health, which is actually on June 3rd at 6 p.m. So the link is above me if you'd like to register and it's for free and virtual. So I encourage you all to, um, to join us for that. But without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce my guest with me tonight, Dr. Mona Shaw. Dr. Shaw, it's so great to have you back with me. How's Hello. everything going? It's good, it's good. I love all this blue zones. It's very, it's amazing all the research that they've done on it. It's great. Glad yeah. you guys are taking this on. I know, I know. So um, have you done anything before with the Blue Zones at all? Or could you tell us maybe from your perspective what you like about it? Yeah, I mean, I haven't done anything. I've heard about it. I've listened to mm -hmm. podcasts where they mention it and stuff. But as per, me personally, I've not done any in-depth research on it. But in preparing for the panel on June 3rd, and then because I'm on that, and then, you know, tonight's talk, I've been researching a lot. And um, the power of nine is that what it's called? The is it power, power nine? nine? Yeah, power mm -hmm. nine, yes. Power nine, not power of nine. Is it's fantastic. I actually like all of nine of them. I'm like I could talk about all of these all day long. They're fin all of them are phenomenal. So, yeah. I mean, I'm glad that you guys are going through all of them, but they're all really, really great. It's very important life lessons. Actually, my dad came to dinner, who's 78, and he's like, I think I have all nine of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's yeah, so amazing. And yeah. I feel like each of them are so intricately important to our longevity too. And just, um, it's opening my eyes, I feel like to a different way for us to look at health, which I know with your holistic background and things like that, um, right. I'm sure you can definitely uh, relate to that. Right. But for a conversation tonight, we're going to be talking about wine at five, right? Uh, interesting one, yeah. I'm sure for you as a cardiologist, you get a lot about, and then also right tribe. Um, so I think uh, if you're okay with it, let's go ahead and start talking a little bit more about that wine at five. Yeah, um, yeah, so I guess my first question on that is, what are the observed alcohol habits of those in the blue zones and why is this part of the power nine? So just to kind of recap, I'm sure you guys have mentioned this in the previous ones, you know, the five blue zones are Loma Linda, California. It's actually the only one in the U.S. And that's actually the only place where they don't drink wine because they're Seventh Day Adventists. Okay, that's the only one. Um, Icaria, Greece, and I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong. If you're Greek, um, Sardinia in Italy, Okinawa in Japan, and and a place in Costa Rica. What is it called? Nicoya, I think, in um, in Costa Rica. So you know, all of those places except for the Loma Linda, they all have some sort of alcohol, mainly red wine. So that's really where, especially in Sardinia, there's actually um, a type of red wines called Cannonau, I guess, mm -hmm. that have really high polyphenols, which I'm sure we'll get into when we talk about why mm -hmm. red wine is so good. But red wine is usually the drink of choice. Now in Okinawa, um, they have one that's called Awamori, which is more like a, it's not sake, it's a little bit different than sake, but that's okay. their alcohol of choice over there. But yeah, the other places they, they drink red wine. Ooh, yeah, one of my favorites for sure. So what is it about drinking wine because I know that there's we we have in the US um, our recommendations about it but but what are the habits of those I mean except for of course the population mm -hmm. that, uh, you know right. what do they do that makes this you know so um, important so a couple of things I think the one of the most important takeaways to me is that they have one slash two drinks a day so mm -hmm. I think that's really important because and it's not that they're just coming home and drinking by themselves in front of the TV. That's that's not what this is. So what they're doing is it's a communal thing. They're using it to de-stress with friends, with community, with people, um, you know, not just drinking by themselves and having four or five a night. I think that's one of the biggest take homes is they're drinking every day, 
but it's an extreme moderation. I mean, really they recommend one for women, one glass of wine or one alcoholic drink um, and two for men. And, you know, the important part is a lot of people don't drink all week here. I'm talking about not, I'm not talking about the blue zones. Okay. What they will do in the blue zones is, you know, binge drink on the weekends. Like, oh, I didn't drink all week. So I'm going to drink my, you know, seven to 15 all on the weekend. That's not considered no. part of a blue zone. Actually, it can be very detrimental. I mean, there's enough mm -hmm. studies that show us, you know, that that is the worst thing that you can do. Um, but that moderate drinking is actually beneficial for your health. It, but the key is moderation. Most people have a very hard time, you know, after you have one glass and you want more, then you want more. And then one becomes two, becomes three. And then you've kind of screwed up um, the whole benefit of, of red wine. Or alcohol, yeah. the alcohol in general. And as you know, what is, you know, a drink? Because when I ask my patients, ah, how much are you drinking? You know, how much are you drinking? And they're like, oh, one or two. I'm like, well, how much is your one glass of wine? So, you know, one glass of wine is four to five ounces, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are drinking eight to nine. Well, that's already two in it's one glass. Like in a yeah. big glass, and, you know, and if you look at like vodka or whiskey or, you know, a hard liquor, it's one and a half ounces is one drink. And that's like... Yeah, that's a little bit. And then, um, you know, beer is about 12 ounces or so. So mm -hmm. that's considered one drink. I think that's really the key. I think that we can really have benefit if we stick to that one drink in those proper amounts, especially red wine. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the um, that you mentioned, too. It's around with friends, you know, yes. and with dinner and that kind of stuff. So that yeah. kind of at five, which is with dinner time. So, right. um, yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that part, too. So, um, I, and I love also the measurements. <laughs> That's yeah. really important of understanding of what is one glass, right? right. But um, are all, I think we kind of mentioned this, but are all types of alcohol created equal in terms of health benefits? That's a great, it's, it, that's a really good question. So polyphenols, which are this big group of biochemicals that are really, really good for um, a lot of health benefits. Okay, so that's what people look for in red wine. That's why red wine's kind of been become so famous, whether it's cardiovascular disease or blue zones or whatever. So polyphenols are flavonoids and there are other compounds that are found in red wine that are antioxidant, they're anti-inflammatory, they make your platelets not stick together. They had actually seen the lining of arteries become healthier with these polyphenols. OK, now you can find flavonoids and polyphenols and other things like fruits and vegetables and dark chocolate. But as far as alcohol, red wine has really the highest amount of polyphenols. Now, um, what is also important to know is that it's not it is kind of important and it gets very technical, which we're not going to get into. It gets very important where you're getting the wine from. What are the grapes? Because these are all coming from the grapes. So the polyphenols come from the grapes and the skin. OK. Mm -hmm. So it depends, as you know, wine is, there's different things with wine, how they ferment it and how long they're sitting in the sun and, you know, all these different caveats. But I think what they found is like in Sardinia, the polyphenols of their grapes, they're really, really rich in polyphenols. You can actually find Sardinian wines, Grenache, maybe you've heard of Grenache. That's the other term of Cannonau. That's a type of red wine that they drink in Sardinia. Oh, okay. And they're That's very high. And Grenache is what we would consider. We, I don't, none of us have probably heard of canon now, but Grenache is what we would consider similar. Um, but, but even in the US, Cabernets are high in polyphenols, Pinot Noirs are high in polyphenols. Um, white wines have a lot less of polyphenols. They have some, but way less than red wines do. Um, so polyphenols, flavonoids, I'm sure you've heard of resveratrol. That's another healthy mm -hmm. compound. A lot of people take um, a lot of people take supplements for that, but those are all what are kind of embedded in these grapes. Now, other alcohols like beer and whiskey and tequila, even they actually have different polyphenols, a little bit different than wines um, that are also beneficial, but they just do different things in the body. They can be anti-cancer, anti-proliferative. Um, some of them even help the arteries, you know, and the lining as well. They've so shown some study that some champagnes because of their polyphenols help dementia prevention. So there's, oh. they all, yeah, it's interesting. They all kind of do little different things, but honestly, the, the best is red wine and everything else is good, but it's not going to be as good as red wine. But still, honestly, when you look at them, I think red wine's the best. 
Um, obviously in Okinawa, they drink this type of sake called awamori, uh, but other healthy ones are, I shouldn't say healthy, other good ones with benefits are uh, whiskey, tequila, um, gin, because it's made out of juniper berries, which is berries, so it's antioxidants. So those are also beneficial um, as well, but red wine kind of takes the cake for polyphenols and flavonoids. Yeah. And I mean, that's so interesting. And I feel like there's such a huge, it kind of opened my eyes a little bit. It's just a, a science behind alcohol. It is. Right. Like that. So it's really interesting. It is. Because um, I mean, I knew red wine was kind of up there, but I didn't realize, you know, with the other types, um, there can be some some health benefits. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, a question too, you know, about if you don't drink alcohol, I mean, yeah. would you say, um, would you recommend to start? I mean, what what kind of, um, what uh, you as a physician, what would you say to someone? Right, so in general, I don't really, if someone's not already drinking, I never recommend they start because okay. it's just really not a good idea to start. You don't know how your body's gonna react. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I mean, the studies are showing if you don't already start drinking, if you're not already drinking, it's probably worse to actually start drinking gotcha. um, just because of, you know, I don't know, I guess it's just because they don't really see the benefit if you haven't really, you know, had all that, you know, drinking um, before in your body and how it metabolizes it. It doesn't mean that you can't start drinking, but most mm -hmm. people who are already drinking, uh, we want to try to lower their drinking most of the time. What I see, especially with COVID, people have been drinking a lot, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. so that has a whole slew of other problems. So if somebody is not drinking already, I, I don't, recommend okay let's start drinking because i have no I, I don't know you know i don't know where it's going to take them are they going to go down the other end um you know because we know that too much drinking is also detrimental you know and so it's that really kind of fine balance of too much uh, alcohol versus none at all yeah okay yeah just out of curiosity you know just if anybody had that um, had that question but i like the, that that um, how you framed it and especially with the moderation you know it's it's mm -hmm you know, kind of that one or two drinks, right? One or one, right? One for women and two for men. Is two for one, because remember, you know, women have breast cancer risk too. And um, obviously, car you know, cardiovascular disease, as we know, is higher risk uh, for women than breast cancer. But alcohol is a high risk with breast cancer as well. So you want to try to find that happy medium. I mean, if you have a very, very high risk of breast cancer, you might want to even drink less than one, to be honest with you, you know, a night. But in general, um, just for general preventative, it's, you know, one one glass for women, two glasses for men. And again, like we already talked about with food, with these healthy other things in the blue zone, you know, being with people, mm -hmm. being, not just kind of sitting by yourself in your closet drinking red wine. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> drinking, you know, wine at five. Yeah, no, definitely. And speaking of that, you know, our the next power nine, I'm hoping that we can talk about is that um, aspect of right tribe, right? Um, and um, the, you know, people that we're around. So um, what does the blue zones mean by right tribe? Could you define that for us? Yeah, so the right tribe is basically um, your crew, if you want to talk about it, your yeah. people. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of describe your people. And in Okinawa, it's actually really interesting. They call it Moai. I might be saying it wrong, but I think it's pronounced Moai, mm -hmm. M-O-A-I. Um, and basically they pick five people when they're young and that they make a pact. Like it's a serious mm -hmm. pact where we're going to live life together. Wow. And we do all our experiences having kids, you know, mm -hmm. um, career, uh, family, relationship, getting older, all those stages of life that we all go through, though that your Maui, we go through, we're going to go through it together. Um, and I think that's, I think it's really, really, I mean, and we all have people right in our lives, or we want to have people in our lives. We strive to have people in our lives that we can actually connect with and that are our tribe, you know, and what does that mean? I mean, I think for all of us, it probably means the people that you know, when you're when you're talking about your problems in life and your stresses you're not a burden to them and vice versa right mm -hmm. it's kind of an open channel and that you can share things with and get and you can be vulnerable with right all of us are a lot of us are afraid of being vulnerable and this tribe is your people that you can just be yourself fully yourself yeah. and go through life together that's how i think it's defined in my in my opinion yeah no that's that's really powerful and it's you know people like you said that 
you know, you can really um, rely on and relate to and kind of go through life with. And I think that's so interesting, like culturally in Japan, that they have that where you make yeah. this pact, you know, when you're younger. I just never thought of, not never thought, you know, of that, you know. Um, but I want to take a pause here and just for our viewers who are tuning in, um, please go ahead and chime in if you have any questions. There's so much great information here from Dr. Shaw, and I'm sure she would love to hear from you, even if it's a, and help. A hello, excuse me. Um, but as continuing with kind of that right tribe aspect, um, would you say that there's certain, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit, certain qualities that we should consider when we're, I guess, defining our right tribe? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's probably personal in general. However, mm -hmm. the bigger picture of it is that you don't feel alone right? You don't feel lonely. And I know being alone and lonely are very different things because you can be alone and not be lonely, um, but you can be alone and be very lonely, right? So I think the key is you want to prevent loneliness and social isolation, okay? Yeah. And you want to kind of go through life um, without having those struggles on a day-to-day -day basis, especially. And, mm -hmm. and I think what they figured out in these communities is doing it together. Like it takes a village to raise a family and go through life and make, you know, and like we talked about in Japan, they have these Moais, but even in Sardinia, they have, you know, they go drink wine all together. You know, they're all talking about what's going on in their life. Um, I'm sure, you know, a lot of us, we have girls night sometimes, you know, and that's kind of a tribe. What are we doing there? We're connecting, we're sharing our life, our stories, what's happening. Uh, men have guys nights too, and they may communicate in a different way. And I think the key is, is preventing loneliness and social isolation. I mean, we know for a fact that people who are lonely and socially isolated, they die 30, 40% more high, faster than people who don't have those. They have more heart attacks, 30% more strokes, more um, when they're lonely and social isolation. And these communal right tribes helps prevent most of that, you know, and um and we may get into it, but you know, I, I think it's really interesting. I actually thought, I thought this study was so interesting. I'm just gonna share it real quick. They did, mm -hmm. they took, um, they took people and grouped them into three. So people that were very socially connected mm -hmm. and then people that were kind of, you know, moderately social connected and then people that were not, like they were, they were low on social connection, low, I, you know, more isolation, more loneliness. And they gave all three groups like a, a hard task to do. OK, um, that they had to kind of figure out. And, you know, any hard task we all get, our stress levels are going to go up a little bit. Right. Cortisol goes up. Um, but what they found was that the people who were in the worst group as far as loneliness and social isolation, their cortisol levels spiked up way higher than people who felt more connected with others because they weren't doing this in a group. They were all doing it alone. But it was just that. Um, just that phenomena by itself made their cortisol higher just because they they were more socially isolated and felt alone and i think what we know is that i think in general people who are more alone and socially isolated their cortisol levels um are generally higher and yeah. their their recovery to stressors are slower than people who have wow. connections and other things. And as we know, cortisol increases inflammation. And you know, we've talked about this, decreases the immune response. Um, it can make arteries sticker, it accelerates aging and all of that. I just I just thought that was a phenomenal study. Like, oh my gosh, how wow. much it can make a difference um, being connected. And look at these blue zones, that's what they're doing. Yeah, wow, that is so interesting. And like, and the fact that they were all separate, but it was just the, yeah. that factor in their lives. That's really interesting. I'm glad you shared that study. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, and with COVID, right? I think that's really been one of the hardest, hardest things for people, especially older people, right? Who probably need more of that. We all need social connection, but yes. it's, it's harder for older people to get on Zoom and FaceTime and you know what yeah. I mean? Well, and there are more at risk for COVID so that things are opening up more. You know, I'm, I'm glad to see when I see in clinic, I see patients actually, I can see that they're happier in general. Yeah. They can connect more. They're a little bit less isolated. They're, you know, they're not as afraid to go out. Um, but yeah, COVID's put a real stinger on that that whole thing. But 
But we know that we now can just be connected with Zoom and FaceTime and talking on the phone and all that. Of course, being in person is much better, but um, yeah. So yeah, definitely um, a lesson that we've all learned and 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 also adapted. I feel like through this time too, it's quite quite interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. but also, um, I and I know for myself, just with the group of friends that I have, you know, doing those health things or influencing each other um, can is a big deal. So, would you say that our health behaviors are contagious? Um, considering, like, you know, those who you um, hang out with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about it this way. If if you're at a dinner party and every single person's eating a piece of big cake, you know, you're probably more likely to eat that piece of cake, right? <laughs> I mean, just think about it, right? I mean, so that's one example. So, and now that's mm -hmm. a physical aspect. Now think of the emotional aspect. I mean, and we've all been in places where we walk into you know, um, our boss's office or a peer's office or a friend's house. And before anyone even says a word, you already know that the energy is like either really good or really bad or something's not good here, you know, and that what is that? So that that's that whatever you want to call it, energy, magnetic field. So that's there between people. And so I definitely know for a fact that loneliness is contagious, social, social isolation is contagious. They've done enough studies to show us that um, even if you're not a lonely person in general, but if you keep hanging out with lonely people or, or have a lot of people that you know that are lonely, you'll probably become more lonely. Um, and wow. vice versa. Yeah, and vice versa. So if you're a lonely person and hang out with people who are really socially connected, it's it's better for you because then you you know you will try, probably become less lonely in that way if that makes sense. So it's mm -hmm. there's definitely some um, contagious you know stuff going on, good and bad on that end. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the other thing is, you know, I think we talked about it before with kindness and oxytocin and some of that stuff and you know, oxytocin is released with kindness and gratitude. And so we know that when, think about it, if you're nice to somebody else and kind of, even if it's, you know, in your tribe, hopefully, you know, you have that kindness going on and gratitude. <laughs> That's a of tribe. Um, but even with other people, if you're kind and show gratitude, oxytocin gets released and you feel good and the other person actually feels good. Like I, I, I think I've talked about before, when you smile at somebody else, you're actually even helping their oxytocin gets released because they feel better because someone else is smiling at them. So it's definitely, there's some connection going on for all of that. Wow. Yeah. And it, it makes sense. I mean, um, I think it was a podcast or something that I listened to about gift giving and I listened to it, you know, kind of around the holidays, but yeah. You know, giving a gift makes you feel just as good as receiving a gift, you know, so that okay. sort of exchange. Um, that's really interesting, though, about, you know, even not just, you know, your physical behaviors, but also like your emotions and how those mm -hmm. can be linked to the people you're around. So certainly yeah. something um, to think about and trying to be that positive influence. I mean, would uh, would you give any um I guess, tips or wisdom um, in being that, you know, positive light in your tribe? Yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> it's really, and, I, and you know, kind of this hits on, um, you know, when we did that talk last time, I've had actually had a couple of patients say, I'm doing the ABCs, you know, <laughs> and talk about, you know, what that is. And, and I think, um, you know, I have my tribe. So, when I, my B, which is, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, Jean and I talked about some stress modifications on our last Facebook Live. And one big thing is your belief about the situation going on around you. That's the B and how to really work on that. Cause that's the only thing that we can change in our lives. We can't really change what's going on outside. And when my B is bad, I have my tribe help me with my B. And so, and when my tribe is going through their bad bees, quote unquote, that's what I'm there for to help yeah. them, help them fix their belief and help them see things in a different way. That's what to me, um, a tribe is for. So we're not always going to be up in the person high in the tribe. I mean, that's not mm -hmm. the point of the tribe. If one person's always up and everyone else is here, that's not really your tribe then. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. the right tribe. Um, your tribe is when everyone is not just pulling from each other, but there's a give and take of um, emotion give, you know, given and emotion received. Because mm -hmm. there are some times where I may be the one in my tribe to be more level headed and calmer and practical and I'm in a good space um, and I can be that for others. And there's other times where I'm not there. 
for whatever reason. And I need my tribe to get me there, you know, whether it's with a glass of wine on a night or just talking, you know, talking or just being together, you know, and sharing. So I don't think we are always expected to be that person. We need those people to be there. But for our own personal selves, that also being said, you can't rely on happiness. You can't rely on others for your happiness. I mean, I, I fully 100% believe that, that happiness comes from within. I know that's such an old saying, but it, it is really true. Like, you can't rely on another person to make you feel happy. You have to find it with from within. And so that's where that B comes in. So to try to be that place, you know, like you and I have talked about when I feel myself going down, when you're asking, how do you do that for yourself? When I feel myself going down, that's when I'll start doing that self-care, taking time for myself. But sometimes it means being alone. Sometimes it means being with my tribe. Sometimes it means eating good, healthy food or having a glass of wine. You know, one of the blue zones is purpose you know, um, as you know, and waking up every morning and having a purpose, that's huge. Not just waking up and being like, oh, I got to go to work and my kids. And that's not purpose. And saying it like that is different. But if you word it differently, I got to go to work and help people and be there for my children, even if they don't want me around all the time, you know, I get to be that person. That's a different way of looking at it than, oh, you know, oh, you know we're mm -hmm. kids. You know what I'm saying? So much of it is about perception. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so happy that you brought that up. And I feel like um, for all the times that we've talked to together, that's almost like that main theme, which I love. I love that. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that you tied it back to what we can ourselves control, but then also in the responsibilities or the shared responsibilities of those in our tribe, you know, that there are some, like you said, are some times where you're up and you help those that are low come up and, and vice versa. So um, I love that. I love because that. If, you don't, if you don't feel like you're going through it alone, that's mm -hmm. a huge difference. If you feel like you're alone in this situation, you're all by yourself. That is a terrible feeling, you know, and if you feel like, OK, wait a minute, I'm not alone in this. There's, you know, five other people who feel the same exact way. It's so comforting and validating that, OK, maybe it's not that bad or maybe it is bad, but we're doing this together. We'll figure it out. You know, yeah. and you're not the only one going through it. Yeah, I love that. Wow. That was just so powerful and something I'm definitely going to take take away from that. Um, so, Dr. Shaw, as our conversation kind of comes to a close, what are um, the most important takeaways you would like to leave our viewers with in regards to Wine at Five and Right Tribe? Okay, so for Wine at Five, I think the key is moderation. Even if you don't like red wine, don't force yourself to drink red wine. Obviously, I kind of talked about the benefits of red wine, but there are other liquors and alcohol, you know, but it's in moderation and not alone. You know, you're doing it with company, with friends, with family, with food, um, and it's more and it's de a de-stressor. So that's why, you know, you want to do it with people and communal um, and in moderation. I think that's the biggest that's the biggest thing is in moderation. Um, and then as far as the right tribe is, um, it's OK to be vulnerable, but find the right people that you can share life with because it is so, so important. Um, so that you don't feel alone because we all can go to places where we feel alone and you know no one understands us and but it, that's not true that's just what your mind's telling you it's not true there are people out there your tribe even if it's two people it doesn't have to be like five like they do in okinawa like maybe two or three you know and that's it that's your little tribe you're going to go through life together um and figure things out together so it's really important to try to find and it's not too late. It's like, oh, I'm you know, six years old. How am I going to find my tribe? It's never too late. You can always find people that you have connections with. So, Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Well, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for joining me um, here tonight. And so great every time to chat with you. I just love um, all of our conversations. And to thank our viewers who are um, tuning in with us as well. Um, we are continuing our Blue Zones conversation next week. So on Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. So be sure to tune in with us. The, la um, the last expert that we have is Dr. Foy, and we're going to be talking about belong and loved ones, which I feel like ties really well into our conversation tonight. But also be sure to um, register for this Assisti lecture that we have have um, the link above. But um, again, thank you, um, Dr. Shaw and our viewers, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.